All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. So we have with us uh, Harun Rahimi. He is a professor of law at the American University of Afghanistan, and he is also a policy researcher. Harun, when I last spoke to you, uh, I spoke to you just days after the takeover, the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. And since then, we saw uh, the two deadly explosions um, at the airport in Kabul. Uh, we saw uh, what happened in Panjshir, uh, the resistance, the protests by women. Uh, in the streets and in the cities. Uh, we also saw that the Taliban have now really taken hold of the entire country. Um, and they recently announced uh, the names in their caretaker government. Uh, now, those that were appointed uh, were majority Pashtun. Well, they were Pashtun. There were no ethnic minorities represented. There were no women. There were no formerly elected uh, government officials. What do you make of those appointments? And do you think that this will be a caretaker or interim government, or perhaps is the Taliban seeing these individuals as more of a permanent establishment? So, I mean, you can look at this uh, government from three, three different uh, point of views. You can adopt an internal point of view and try to make sense of what it meant for the group itself. You can adopt a broader view of Afghans um, who are not part of the Taliban movement, how would they uh, um, understand this, uh, this government? And you can obviously take an international perspective to see how other countries see this. Internally, um, my understanding is that it was meant to um, maintain internal cohesion and uh, distribute the power in a way that would satisfy the main power uh, holders within the movement to avoid internal discontent, basically, try to make sure that the group remains uh, cohesive and avoid fracturing. Why I say that, uh, why do I say that? I mean, Taliban have been saying until right before they announced their government that they would form an inclusive government. It tells me that they knew that there would be a demand, that there would be a kind of a, 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 some sort of consequences if they chose to exclude others. But yet, they announced a government that was exclusively from the Taliban, within the Taliban movement. It tells me that they had to do it this way, or they would have uh, caused internal internal fractions in the group because they were aware of the cost of having a Taliban-only government. That's why they've been saying they would uh, form an inclusive government, but they had to go against their word because I think they need to uh, maintain internal cohesion. So, what it means for the in, uh, for inside the group, it mostly. Uh, as you said, our old uh, guard, meaning the people who were involved in the government in the 90s. There are other constituencies in the Taliban movement that I think were not prominent in the government in the announcements. For example, the military commanders of the group who uh, obviously received most of the credits for winning the war were not that prominent. There are only few top military names uh, in, in, uh, in the government. There are many big commanders that were excluded uh, there was Ahmad Zay, Sadr, I mean, other people whose name was mentioned as major Taliban commanders who were excluded. You is that also a positive indication? Sorry to interject. Is that a positive indication that uh, military commanders were not given these top posts? I mean, we even see that the caretaker prime minister is Mullah Muhammad Hassan Akund, and he is more of an ideological figure. Is that a positive right. indication or is that more of a strategic? I mean, there are only so many security positions to distribute. Right? I mean, it could be a function of, okay, uh, we will not be able to accommodate. I mean, there are a few kind of security uh, portfolio to give out. And the question was who would receive those? I think that was the question. And one question was um, political leaders versus military leaders. The other uh, question was, the new generation of Taliban versus the old generation of Taliban, like the Taliban of the vanguard, Taliban who started the movement and the Taliban who were most of the fighting and were the new generation. There were some elements of the new generation incorporated, but the government is predominantly old guard. So you have that kind of uh, internally, that's a point of tension, I imagine. And that was a decision to be made to go with old guards instead of the new generation. Although there are some elements of new generation included. So you have an, old guard, mostly political and ideological heavy headers, not, not a lot of military big names uh, were given posts yet. So that's kind of an internal view. And I think this was a balance they had to reach to maintain internal cohesion. What it means, what should we take from this, uh, from uh, understanding the movement, 
it tells me that the group is very much beholden to its own internal dynamic. It, it, the government can, cannot operate autonomous from its internal factions. That would mean the people who hope the group would moderate its stance or compromise or balance different objectives of inclusivity or rewarding fighters and such, like balance different objectives, they may be disappointed because it seems like the group, in order to remain cohesive, has to actually be, be completely beholden to internal factions to satisfy those and cannot act independently of those strong interest groups within the movement. So if you were now going to the outsider view, if you were like United States, if you were China, if you were any other countries looking to see if you can have relationship with, uh, with the Taliban, I think you may have taken the lesson from this announcement that Taliban cannot deliver much. Um, they are very much constrained in terms of what they can do. They've said- Which they factions are they constrained to? Which factions are they constrained to um, that, that they have to kind of give in to? Uh, to not be able to form a more inclusive government, just so we can sort of understand the dynamics. So you have military, obviously, military who actually fought. You have the old timers who have the this kind of position, status of being the founders of the group, ideological kind of uh, vanguard of the group, and the people who have to put in the most of the time, so they have this reverence about them. Um, you also have this southern eastern divide. Uh, 12 of the appointee uh, of the announced names are from Louis Kandahar. Like if you consider Kandahar, Nangarhar, uh, sorry, Kandahar, Kandahar, uh, Helmand, and that region of the country, 12 people come from that area. That's the founding kind of place of Taliban. 10 right. uh, other people come from the Eastern, it's called Louis Pektia. That's where, Nang, uh, where the uh, Haqqani network has its a school of madrasas, like the network of madrasas and, and a basic uh, base uh, in that area. So 22 is just two major uh, kind of bases of the Taliban movement, Haqqani base and the founder base of Kandahar. So are there divisions on multiple sort of levels or Absolutely. is this more of like one group that's calling the shots in terms of who gets what position? I think it tells us that the group, it has a lot of interest groups inside it. Like there are a lot of push and pulls inside the group. And for the group to remain cohesive, everyone has to be satisfied or most like the majority must be satisfied. That means they cannot really do much other than distribute the power in a group in a way to keep everyone in. Like if you think of about, okay, every policy decision that one make, they're gonna to have to satisfy different constituencies within the group. That would mean right. the most extremist voices, like the people who are holding like the most extreme views, if you, if you adopt a, a, a more kind of relaxed, a more moderate Taliban approach versus a more, extreme Taliban approach. The extreme Taliban approach would have a veto power because they have to be satisfied for the group to actually be able to remain cohesive and moderate. And it seems so far the group cannot do that. Like they basically, they cannot piss off a lot of major constituencies, any major constituency within the group and get right. away with it. Um, right, so, so Harun, we've discussed those internal divisions. Uh, how much of a say uh, do you think foreign parties have had in terms of who gets which position, who is included in this government, who is excluded from this government, were there vested interests on behalf of uh, foreign parties? I think, there, I mean, there are many countries that have interests. What we heard publicly from all the countries were that they wanted the Taliban to form an inclusive government. Obviously, they did not have a common definition of what inclusivity meant. Most countries wanted uh, a certain constituency within Afghanistan to be included, constituencies that have ties with them. Other countries wanted just more inclusivity to make sure that the government would be able to govern. So meaning that Afghanistan would remain stable and it would not face uh, internal, more internal tensions. What came out of this suggests that Taliban are not that sensitive to external demands or they cannot be. I mean, they, it could have been a choice or it could have been the only way to maintain internal cohesion. Both is possible. If you look at the example of Pakistan though, because it's a unique case, I think it's more complicated. Taliban have a complicated relationship with, the, with the, uh, Pakistan. Some say it's a proxy, I don't buy that. Uh, so Pakistan has also tortured, imprisoned, and killed Taliban leaders. Mullah Brother, who was favored to be the head of the government, who ended up not being the head of the government, was in yeah. Pakistan uh, prison for a very long time. And he's not an exception, many were. So, Obviously, Pakistan provided sanctuaries and help 
uh, the, the Taliban movement, but at the same time, it was known to punish, to torture, to arrest and put pressure on the Taliban as well. So if now you are a Taliban government that you don't need Pakistan as much, I think different people have different kind of relationship, different responses to the Pakistan demands. Many people have interpreted the fact that the Mullah brother was taken off as the head of the government and was replaced He's by- He's been given the deputy, right? Right, which is a demotion yeah. because he was the head of the Doha office, which was basically right. supposed to be like the-, the It was face assumed of the he would be the prime minister. It was actually reported, Reuters reported that many in kind of trusted sources had told the Reuters that he would be the head of the government. Uh, but then he was taken off. Some interpreted that as Pakistan being able to exert influence over the process to make sure that an unfriendly figure would not be the head of the Taliban government. How much of it is true or not? I think we don't really know. But I think there is enough circumstantial evidence that suggests Pakistan got uh, had some influence and used that to empower pro-Pakistani elements in the Taliban and try to keep the unfriendly forces of the of Taliban outside the, the government. Because you have to realize for Pakistan, it's not just a matter of proxy or like having their say in Afghanistan, it's also counterterrorism. They have a huge interest in making sure the Taliban, uh, Pakistani Taliban are kept in control. So they would have a lot of interest on what the Afghan government chooses to do with the, the regard to the, uh, ta Taliban of Pakistan, which have a lot of play, fact, fighters right. inside of Pakistan. Security interests at stake. Uh, yeah. Harun, uh, the Taliban has asked political leaders uh, to return. For instance, uh, the former uh, president, Ashraf Ghani, uh, they have said they have asked for them to return and they have vouched for their safety. Would the caretaker government have looked different if members of the government, the most uh, high-level members of the government, hadn't fled the country? So the hope was um, that, um, I mean, depends on what kind of time frame you're looking at. I mean, uh, if we started the peace negotiation, if there was much more willingness to compromise in 2014, obviously we would have a different kind of arrangement. I mean, kind of by, by the time, I mean, the trend was that the Taliban gained strength and the government lost ground so the, i mean you could think did the government point. lose ground or did the government also leave ground i mean i think my i mean you can analyze why it why it unfolded the way it did but the bottom line was that the government was losing its control over the country and taliban were right. gaining ground ground okay. both, both in terms of territory but also in the momentum international momentum so everything every way you can think of the strength every measure of the strength Taliban were gaining the strength and the government was in the defense. So, I mean, it depends on like, what point in time you're going to look at and say, okay, at, at this point, there was a, a temporary arrangement, a, a transitional arrangement agreed to what kind of, how it would look like. But before the, when the Kabul was surrendered, like towards the very end, we're talking about like one day before took over Kabul, the hope was that there will be an agreement where there will be a ceasefire. Taliban would agree not to enter Kabul to take over the government by force. And in exchange, President Ghani would transfer power to a transitional government that would be very much close to Taliban as well. Right? It would have been, not been like a neutral, but it would have been a mixture of the past 20 years, the, the system that emerged in the past 20 years, and the Taliban. And that transitional authority would oversee the creation of a caretaker government, like a new government that would be replaced. If it had happened like that, obviously we would have seen a more conciliatory, kind of reconciliatory uh, caretaker government. It did not happen like that, partly because President Ghani escaped the country and kind of removed anything to negotiate over. And there was really nothing for Taliban to negotiate over. Also, it created a vacuum that the Taliban claimed they had to step in, take over Kabul to just maintain security because the state institutions crumbled from within. So there was a power vacuum. Whether Taliban are sincere or they, whether they would not have attacked Kabul anyway, that's an open question. We really don't know. I mean, Taliban have in the past also said they would agree to um, some sort of interim government, but they kind of backed down. So it could have been that even if Ghani had stayed in power, they would have attacked Kabul and it would be becoming bloody and they would have still uh, took over uh, the country with, taken over the country with, with force and they would have all the whole cards to impose whatever government they want. That's also a possibility. But we did not get to test them on that assertion because Ghani made the whole situation moot because they you know, right. made a vacuum and Taliban were the only one who could step in there were reports from New York Times that the Taliban kind of, I don't know how much accurate it is, but the report of New York Times said that the uh, Taliban told the Americans if they wanted to take over security of Kabul or just the airport. 
uh, so they would not have to step in. But the U.S. apparently made the choice to take over the security of the airport and leave the rest of the, the Kabul to for the air for the Taliban to take over. Now that the government institutions were already crumbling after uh, President Ghani escape. So we don't right. know. I'm not sure of the accuracy of that either, but definitely something worth looking into. Uh, since we are talking about the former president, Ashraf Ghani, uh, he issued a formal apology to Afghans, and he also denied the allegations of corruption and of money laundering. Uh, he says he welcomes an official audit and investigation as long as it's under the UN or an independent body. How do you view that? How do you view his apology? This is not the first apology, of course. First, he issued uh, an apology very earlier on. This is his second Actually, apology, he and now he's denied the corruption that, allegations. That that's I mean, he has made two statements, public statements since he left Afghanistan. Right. The first statement did not include an apology. That's one that's when I mean that was like right after. Like you're talking about like right. one day after that was more his in, reasoning, not an apology. Right. And okay. most of that was refuting the fact that he has stole money, uh, like he took money with him. And he gave his own a version of the events as to how he it unfolded. He basically said there were credible reports that there was assassination attempt. The people inside the presidential palace and my guard told me I have to leave the country. It was so abrupt and it was not planned and I did not get to take anything with me. That was his first version. Did not include an apology and did not include any admission of responsibility for what unfolded. Uh, the second what do you thing, think is the validity of the assassination attempts? Has there been any no verification of that? I mean, there's been no proof of it. Um, and the people who look into it said, I mean, it, it seems it's very unlikely that the Taliban were that close. But whether he was told that or not, that's also a different statement. I mean, obviously he did not, he was relying on people around him and the people around him had an interest to leave the country because I think it looked like the Taliban would take over. If it was a matter of hours, I think, to them. There are reports contradicting Ghani's uh, version of events. For example, people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs admitted the people who are politically opposed to him said that he had collected his passport early on, like days before the events the day, unfolded. Yeah. So he kind of shows some pre-planning. There was a statement made by the person who was a photographer at the uh, presidential palace um, on social media, a person who claimed to be the photographer that suggested there were early planning going on early in the day because he said he escaped in the afternoon. So, I mean, we really don't know. I don't think we know at this point, but I don't think it's relevant. Uh, right. The second statement he made, again, he- The corruption allegations, yeah. Right. It was mostly also about the corruption allegation, um, mm -hmm. but the apology he made the second time was he apologized for how things ended. Um, and he was- Is that enough for a funds? Is that apology I don't, enough? Absolutely, no, absolutely not. I think unless he admits responsibility, um, he was the president for seven years. It was not like he was handed over the government the last days. He was in charge seven days and uh, seven years. And his seven years are known for, he's known during those seven years for monopolizing power and basically making all the shots. He and a very close circle of allies uh, within, the, within the presidential palace. So. He, unless he accepts major responsibility for uh, what happened in the country and sincerely apologize, I don't think anyone in Afghanistan would have any respect for him. And obviously, apology is not enough because he, his actions, his policies left 30 million Afghans defenseless against the Taliban. I mean, Taliban are part of Afghanistan, but they're not representing the country in, by any stretch of imagination. And the fact that now they get to monopolize 100% of the power, I mean, you saw the caretaker government is all Taliban. The fact that they get to do that is because the state collapsed. If there was a better resistance at the same time with the peace process, we could have seen a more kind of inclusive government, which included the elements of the past 20 years, as well as Taliban. That would have been the ideal. Harun, the what do you make of the corruption allegations, though? Uh, what do you make of those? Do you foresee... Uh, an investigation into those corruption allegations in the near future? I think President Ghani himself may not be investigated just because it's politically, I think, too controversial for countries because you have to remember that he was in charge when most of the world was in Afghanistan. So it would be a lot of incriminating to a lot of people. He did not do, uh, I mean, US and many other actors had to sign off on many things he did. So I think politically it would be too scandalous to drag him into any uh, serious investigation because I think it's going to, for sure, bring in American generals and such, just because of the fact that they were pretty much co-governing Afghanistan. I mean, there were many actors involved. 
And I think politically it'd be too costly for anyone to do it. And it's not consequential because I think he's not a politically relevant actor anymore. So holding him accountable is not gonna be a lot of positive coming out of it. But many actors, many government officials may be investigated by different governments uh, that have jurisdiction over them. I mean, uh, there were people in his cabinet who live in the US, they're US citizens, they're European citizens, and the courts of those countries may, upon private lawsuits brought by Afghan, other Afghans, have to look into and investigate and con uh, convict other actors, other members of the government. I hope it happens. I think Afghans deserve um, accountability. I mean, it was a horrible thing that happened to them. Uh, gains of the gains that were uh, that came at the cost of thousands of soldiers dying every month. If you look at the the reports, like Biden says, uh, Afghans did not fight. But if you look at the reports, thousands were dying every month. Thousands of soldiers were dying every month. Um, there were many were attacks dying. on soldiers as well leading up to this. Absolutely. After the deal the U.S. made, uh, Taliban stopped attacking anyone but the Afghans, right? And mostly um, Afghan army that was doing the fight was actually losing, losing the men. Civilian, obviously, casualties very high. The army, Kabul, the press Kabul, as well. Yes. There was a string of assassinations in Kabul, uh, widely known to be uh, attributed by, uh, to the Taliban. So, I mean, people, people were suffering a lot for the sake of preserving um, some, of the, some of the elements of the republic. I mean, they could have given up and given power to the Taliban early on and not die and not cost that many lives, but they were fighting to preserve some of the Republic. And now his actions, and it, I'm not referring to his last day, I mean, his actions over seven years of his presidency basically destroys any hopes of maintaining anything, uh, 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 elements from the Republic. Harun, ISIS-K has been around since 2015. Um, there's a lot of talk about ISIS-K now. This is uh, something that's all over the media. Uh, and they were uh, the ones that were behind the attacks on Kabul airport. Uh, more attacks are expected. There is intelligence uh, in regards to that. Uh, the security apparatus in Afghanistan has collapsed, virtually collapsed. Who is protecting Afghans? And does the Taliban have any security plan? Because I, I, I saw the appointments and there are people that have been appointed to those security roles. But who is leading security forces? Is there any security apparatus? So in terms of who's in charge, the head of internal security, which would be Minister of Interior in Afghanistan, is Sarajuddin Haqqani, the person who heads the Haqqani network. Haqqani network is the most uh, sophisticated and, and the most well-disciplined force within the Taliban. So the Badri uh, corps that often is called, uh, they were in charge of securing the airport and other important uh, installations inside the country are of the Haqqani network. That is the person who's in charge of the internal security. In terms of who's in charge of the Ministry of Defense, like uh, that would be more of the equivalent of the army, it's uh, Mullah Omar's son, uh, Yaqub, uh, Mullah Yaqub, who's the Minister of Defense. He's known not to have a lot of military credentials. Um, he was the head of the military commission, but he was known not to be the actual person who was running. The chief army, like the chief of the army is actually a Tajik from Badakhshan. Um, um, he's known to have links with many anti-Central Asian uh, and anti-Chinese terrorist groups in Afghanistan, but he's the head of the army. Like those are the people in charge of the security. Um, people in charge of the intelligence sector uh, of obviously well, less known because of the fact that the intelligence is obviously more, uh, the, operates differently. Whether they can secure Afghanistan, I think, honestly, we don't know, partly because there's not a lot of good information as to what's going on inside the country. Um, Taliban- There's no transparency about any security planning or any plans for, for the future also, of the country? Or even like what's going on in the country. I mean, there have been a chilling effect on journalism. A lot of journalists chose to leave Afghanistan because they felt threatened. I mean, in major cities like Kabul and Herat, we get some footage and some reporting, but like- yes. in, in Kandahar or like in Ghazni or like in Wardak, you really don't, we really don't know what's going on. Like, is there fighting going on? Is there been terrorist attack? I mean, a lot could have been, uh, could be going on and we don't know. The same, we don't have eyes inside the country the same way we did before where there was much more robust journalism in, in the country. And there've been a lot of people written on what that means. Um, the second issue is whether there is a plan in place. Obviously Taliban don't operate like a normal government. So there's no press conference and like the sharing and public consultation. Uh, of any way, any, any sort. And they're much more secretive in terms of their operation. There've been an insurgency, so that mode of operation continues. Whether they can actually curb the threat of um, ISKP, which the, the, the I, um, ISK, 
they uh, have fought ISK before. Um, there was a lot of uh, people believe that the, uh, the ISK was becoming irrelevant in Afghanistan uh, because both the government and the international forces and the Taliban were hit, hitting them very hard. They had some sleeper cells in Kabul that could have coordinated the attack on the airport. The fact is when the US, when the Afghan state collapsed, a lot of members of the IS, uh, ISK, which were in presence, got to basically go free. And there are reports that up to 2,000 prisoners uh, were, were able to flee. So now they have a momentum. What have Taliban done to prevent this? Um, obviously, they are much brutal force than the, uh, than the previous government. Um, there are reports that certain figures who were seen as preachers who were major uh, figures in the ISIS were arrested, killed, and uh, in mysterious, under mysterious circumstances. There are reports that they have closed down madrasas that are known to spread Salafi message. That Salafi is the kind of this brand of Islam that I'm sorry, ISIS. You're saying uh, the Taliban has closed these uh, madrasas? Yes. So they're working on reforms in uh, that aspect as well? So there are these madrasas that we're talking about religious schools. Right. Where yes. the Taliban, uh, where the ISIS- They closed down the up. Salafi ones. Absolutely. They have okay. closed down Salafi madrasas. It's one part of the plan supposedly to curb ISIS pay in Afghanistan. They have arrested a lot of preachers, a lot of major uh, intellectual figures in the, in the world of Salafi in Afghanistan. Um, so they are trying to curb ISIS in Afghanistan. Both they are going after them militarily because there were reports of some people being arrested and then find their, their dead body being found. They're also closing down their basically propaganda machine by addressing the preachers, but targeting the preachers. Harun, just to clarify, uh, these measures were taken after the Taliban took over, right? Well, from what you're saying, it seems like a systematic approach, uh, just comparing it to how Pakistan goes after terrorist groups. I would say some of those principles are uh, similar. Uh, but since we're talking about, you also mentioned how the press was attacked uh, and we're not getting enough transparency out of Afghanistan uh, because the press is also under fire. Uh, the caretaker prime minister, uh, Mullah Mohammed Hassan Akund, I just want to quote him. He said that uh, the stage of bloodshed, contempt and killing has ended for people in Afghanistan. And yet there are reports of the Taliban attacking people, attacking the press. Uh, do you see this discontent and resistance towards the Taliban increasing? I think it's going to depend. Or will it stifle at some point? What's, I mean, what's your observation? Right, I think it's going to depend. First of all, there have been uh, uh, examples of reprisals, uh, killing like people of the previous government uh, being targeted. There have been examples of journalists being targeted, many people uh, being arrested. Taliban often deny them or, or they say it did not happen or they say it's an issue of discipline within the group. Like they are, we're gonna look into it. These are bad actors. Uh, we are still are in kind of an uncertain stay, stance. We have internal discipline issues. We're gonna, we are trying to consolidate their, our power. Things are gonna stop. How genuine they are and how much they will be able to control their fighters, that's gonna be a factor. If they are not able to control their fighters, it doesn't matter what the prime minister says, if they cannot control fighters, things may continue. And those killings are obviously gonna create a cycle, a vicious cycle of reprisals and like revenge and the kind of war that often continues in Afghanistan. With regard to um, resistance, armed resistance against the Taliban group, there's only very limited of it in Panjshir yet. Um, and it was the elements of the previous, in Panjshir, there is still armed resistance going on. There's Taliban still an armed the, struggle in Panjshir? Yes. They're, they've taken over the major installations in Panjshir and they control the road in Panjshir, Taliban control. But right. they and were Ahmed elements- Masood of, said that he's willing to discuss uh, the process. And that uh, it sounded like the resistance had ended, but you're saying that there is still a resistance right. continuing. So in there, was a move, there was a moment in time where Panjshir was surrendered. There was heavy fighting going on. There was exactly. an ulama council in Kabul. Uh, that is a national ulama council, not the Taliban council, the national council who said there should be a ceasefire. And uh, the resistance in Panjshir was in, on the losing side. They were losing a lot of men and ground. And they said they are willing to do ceasefire, stop both sides, stop fight if Taliban kind of withdraw their forces from Panjshir and engage in, 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 in peace negotiations, basically reconciliation negotiations. 
Taliban did not do that. They went full force. They did not announce ceasefire, and they took over the province by force. But they, what they took over was the, basically the road and the major government installations. Pash is a valley, so there's a lot of mountains. Yeah. Elements of resistance and remote areas as well. Right. So the elements of the resistance fled to the mountains, and they are still attacking Taliban from those mountain tops. So there's actual fighting going on today. For example. Many civilian population that were still living in, in uh, Panjshir chose to leave. Panjshir was given a pass to leave Panjshir because the fighting is so intense. It's not all the entire province. There are places that it's happening, but it's still armed resistance going on. How it significant has- of, a, of a resistance, uh, of a challenge could this pose for the Taliban, the resistance coming out of Panjshir? Do you think it's significant enough to weaken the Taliban? If it had spread to other parts of the country, if you had seen like armed resistance in other parts of the countries, other part of the country, then I would have had a different um, uh, kind of assessment. So far, it hasn't. It has remained contained to Panjshir. Um, whether that's going to change with time, because Taliban also took a few years to reassert their insurgency. I mean, they were toppled in 2001, and the Taliban insurgency against the government did not start fully until 2004 or 5. So, I mean, it takes time to organize an insurgency against uh, against Taliban. So, I mean, we may have to see, but the current version of it, the insurgency the resistance in Panjshir um, hasn't spread yet. So it's remained contained to Panjshir. That could change partly because it is taking an ethnic dimension uh, because uh, it is, because also the government, the announcement of the government and the fact that more than 90% of the appointments are Pashtuns and also I have to admit, and, and a subgroup in Pashtun, within the Pashtun as well. Pashtun is a di- Pashtuns are a diverse community. Obviously, there are nationalist Pashtuns who oppose Taliban, and they were major of the ex-government. There are technocrats Pashtuns, highly educated, globalized, uh, that were supporters of the ex-government. So there are basically Pashtun Talibs who are represented in the in the government, and that also means that the resistance is seeing defining itself against the Pashtun government. So it's taking an ethnic dimension. Whether that could mean that it's going to become much more popular and there will be other non pashtuns who will be willing to join the resistance, it's a question we have to see. I'm, what I'm more personally interested in is the non-violent resistance that is going on in the country, the mass demonstrations, mostly by women. I think those are better indicators because there are, there are, those are bottom-up. Very organic, important to highlight, yes. Yes, organic, bottom-up, led by women, and they are basically putting their, their lives on line to make demands against the government that is known to be very repressive. Um, how Taliban react to them, whether they would allow those protests to continue, whether they listen to them, I think that's gonna be more important uh, for the, the long-term uh, uh, vision of the country because armed resistance, I mean, generally are known, I mean, when violence is the currency, most extremists, the most violent actually come at the top. I mean, Afghanistan has had a bloody 40 years conflict I don't want this. It is a war fatigued country. Yeah. If we have peace and peaceful resistance to the challenge to the Taliban, um, like nonviolent political activism against Taliban, and if that proves to be effective in any way, as gradual as as, as it may be, I think that's a better path to take rather than continuation of war. So we're seeing a lot of brave women on the streets, which you highlighted uh, in, in Kabul and other cities in Afghanistan that are taking up that nonviolent struggle. Uh, can we see, will we be seeing more uh, men within those crowds that are protesting? Do you see this movement, this nonviolent movement growing perhaps? Um, first or of is, all, the I mean, morale, is the morale right. decreasing? Right, you have, to, you have to also highlight that not the entire country is against the Taliban. Taliban victory was welcomed by a constituency in Afghanistan for different reasons. Some are ideologically aligned with the Taliban, but others welcomed it as an end of war because now for the 99% of the country, if you exclude Panjshir, there's really no war going on. So there were thousands of people dying every week in Afghanistan. Now that stopped. So a lot of people welcome that as a, as, a, as, a, as a moment of respite. And I think we have to acknowledge that not, not the entire country is resisting Taliban. Um, There are people who are happy with the Taliban takeover because their ideology aligned with the ideology of Taliban. But there's a larger population that is happy that the war is over 
they are kind of happening. But aren't there attacks still taking place? At least there are reports coming out. And of course, we're living in the age of disinformation as well. So we don't always know which reports are true. But there are reports of violence as well. The country so is not, do you think the war is truly over? I think 99% of it is, right? I mean, if, if you're not, I mean, there are hospitals and there are like other places that you can look at to see the figures. I mean, the numbers have obviously dropped and most of the country is not experiencing violence the, the way they were experiencing it weeks ago even. Um, so that's a welcome development for, for many Afghans. I just wanted to highlight that because we're talking about resistance and opposition. We should have to have this context in mind that a lot of Afghans welcome this development as a positive because it was the end of the war. And many right. also welcome it because they believe the Taliban mis message about creating an Islamic system. They may share that definition as well. But there is a resistance, a strong resistance, uh, mostly non-violent so far. And it's led by women. Why is it that the women are there and whether men join or not? I think it's partly because the Taliban are known to be very misogynistic. I mean, the hist I mean, women have more to lose with the Taliban takeover, obviously. Right. The memories of the 90s, also the memory of insurgency. So Talib, I think women in Afghanistan feel like if they actually don't go out on the streets and make their demands heard, they may actually lose everything. Compared to men, I mean, men haven't suffered as much under Taliban. Just, I mean, it is a male dominated society and Taliban are part of the society, but all Taliban are the extreme version of the male dominated society of Afghanistan. So I think the calculations for women are completely different. Also, it's the fact that the Taliban have a harder time um, actually using violence against women compared to men. I mean, uh, arresting a man, putting him in jail, torturing them like they did with some journalists is different than arresting a woman in Afghanistan. Just, just, it doesn't matter how people feel about Taliban, but if you mistreat a woman publicly, that's right. going to have a lot more backlash in a conservative society like Afghanistan than if you right. just mistreat men. If Taliban go around and beat men, it would be less costly to if they go around and beat women. Harun, if I may interject, um, I do understand, and I'm sure our viewers may or may not, but of course there's a cultural norm uh, when it comes to how women are treated in public spaces, uh, even if they may be subjugated, but they are not physically treated in a certain way for the most part, or at least that's frowned upon. But uh, there, there were reports of, of violence against women uh, when it came to the Taliban in, in the past few years, in fact, in the recent past as well. Uh, so is it because the world's eyes are now on the Taliban, the Taliban wants legitimacy, uh, that we are seeing relatively, and I stress on the word relatively, uh, peaceful, nonviolent uh, protests? I think absolutely, um, um, and the Taliban are worried both about the domestic backlash. Um, I mean, if they were given, I mean, if, if they could impose the rules the way they did it in the 90s against women and don't face a, a strong resistance, I think they would. Ideologically, they haven't changed. Like they believe the same things they believe about women. If you look at, um, if you just go on Twitter and see the debates are going on by the yes. pro-Taliban accounts, you don't really see about a women of, even holding positions in the ministry. There have been absolutely, debates absolutely. on behalf of yeah. the Taliban. The whole idea that women belong to in the, in the home and their job is primarily to raise kids, and maybe in health sector because we need women to treat other women, they should be allowed. Education sector a little bit more constrained, but yes. But when it comes to other sectors of the government, there's a lot of reservation. So I think ideologically they haven't changed, but practically I think they now realize both because the world is watching and. Things get out. I mean, everyone has a phone under camera. And there's going to be a cost to to imposing the 90s style rule in Afghanistan, but also because Afghanistan changed. So they, I think, they would have a hard time. They would face more resistance if they were to impose the 90s style kind of uh, rule in the country. They did try. I think they still will try. And I think I take them at their word that they say our ideas haven't changed, but we're going to be more gradual or will be more prudent in terms of how we implement them. I think that's what they're actually doing. They believe the same things they believed in the 90s, but now they understand that they have to be more gradual or be much more prudent in terms of how they go about doing it. That means maybe, okay, we will allow women to work, but we'll try to put constraints on it. And then we'll try to make it harder for them to get a job, but not gonna come out and say, all women are banned uh, at once. Uh, when the women go out on the street, if, if the cameras are there, if there is a large group of women, we're not gonna lose use brutal force against them, but we're going to try to intimidate them. We're going to try to make them scared so they don't come out again. I mean, 
I think those are a matter of techniques and they've used different range of techniques, but in terms of fundamental ideology, I really don't think it's changed much. So Harun, basically, uh, if I may say so, uh, what you're saying is, is that they, their ideology hasn't evolved. It's, there's no departure in terms of ideology when it comes to what it was in the 90s. Uh, but however, their tactics have changed. Uh, the way that they present themselves has changed and how they make that ideology more digestible for the generation that has that has completely evolved culturally and technologically. Uh, that's what's evolved about the Taliban. Absolutely. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I would add says what they can do has changed. They could have done a lot more in the 90s in terms of imposing themselves on the population. It's not a matter of they choosing um, not to impose. I think they also realize that there is limit to what they can do in today's Afghanistan in terms of going to the extent they would like to go if they could. Right. Um, so absolutely, I mean, it's not. Contr- it's adding to what you were saying that. Um, they, I think it's not a matter of proof. I mean, the matter of them saying, okay, we just want to be going more gradual because that's the right way to go. Because it's also, I think, because they cannot go to the extent that they could go in the 90s just because they're going to be facing more resistance from Afghanistan, from the population. Right. Like you said, uh, they are constrained. Harun, for the past two years leading up to this uh, shocking moment for much of the world who wasn't paying attention on Afghanistan, uh, but the people that were, were seeing this coming. They saw that it was foreseeable. But for the past two years, uh, there were talks that were taking place uh, with the Taliban. There were the Afghan peace talks uh, that happened in Qatar. Then there were talks that happened in Turkey, uh, talks that were also taking place in Moscow. Were these peace talks effective in any way? Uh, or did they did the deals in these talks uh, give legitimacy to the Taliban. I mean, where did it all go wrong? How do you see that? I think uh, in terms of what went wrong, the, I, I believe fundamentally that there was a crisis of legitimacy. The previous government had a crisis of legitimacy and it was mostly because of its own doing. Um, the, for example, there are two different ways you can think of legitimacy. One is whether um, there was a um, like the democratic process was working well enough to bring people into the system, like give people a voice, like make government accountable to the population. It did not. The government was not accountable to the population for different reasons. First of all, it was a very highly centralized system, meaning that people vote uh, on average five times, five years, five years, because that was a presidential election. All the power was basically in the hand of the president. And the people could only vote like for the president every five years. And even then, all elections were rife with, with corruption and irregularities. So in terms of having a government that is accountable to the people, it did not exist. It simply did not exist. P- the government was very unpopular, and it could be. There was really nothing people could do. If you talk, talk to any Afghan, very few could, would have good things to say about the government. They had very bad things, but the government was not responsive. did not have to change. The government did not have to fight corruption more to remain in office. The government did not have to make different appointments to please people. They really did not. They could operate despite the fact that people did not approve of what they were doing. So they Because they had on. international legitimacy? It was a rentier. I mean, the political system was dependent, I mean, on the political backing of foreigners, right? Uh, right. And the United States was giving them money and supporting these people because also the U.S. felt like they had only those parts. I mean, that they, they believed that their mission in Afghanistan was tied up with this political class and they could not risk failing this political class because they thought the failure of the political class on the Republican side, quote unquote, meant the winning for the Taliban. So they, they, I'm not blaming all the US. It was not an easy choice to make. Holding President Penny accountable was not that easy for the president for the United States to do either. But the people obviously were powerless. Compared to the Americans, like the US ambassador could have met President Ghani five times a day and make them demand. And those demands were taken seriously because the government was almost entirely dependent on the US military financial support. A, a large group of Afghans demonstrating in the cities for days would not have the same effect. And they did. There were large demonstrations at time for a specific demand. The government chose to den- ignore them and could ignore them with not much consequences. I mean. It's not like the working systems of checks and balance in the, another country where the parliament could hold the government accountable. So, so basically it was not a working democracy in a sense that the government could not be held accountable by the population. That's why what people wanted did not matter much. That's kind of one aspect. 
The other aspect is the government was actually failing to do its job. So not only it was not responsive to people, it also could not deliver services, could not maintain security, could not enforce the laws. So it was basically a, an, an effective government that was also unrepresentative and unresponsive to the population. It, it, it doesn't mean that the people were supporting the Taliban, like they, that's not it. I think it was just the government failed and continued to fail and Taliban just filled in the gap, like the vacuum, because they were the only organized force, a strong alternative around, right? Uh, that's how it happened. So I don't think Taliban, because a lot of people talk about how ingenious the Taliban were and how great they were and how masterminded everything. They were not fighting against a robust set of institutions. They were not right. fighting against the political system that was working well. They were fighting against the system that was rotten to its core, that was disconnected from the population, that was entirely dependent on foreigners who decided for their own national interest to leave Afghanistan. So foreigners who way, were withdrawing very soon. They were basically not backing the government anymore because they made a determination based on their own foreign for national security, not the conditions on the ground, that they would not no longer want to be engaged. If you put it in those terms, Taliban taking over was going to happen. I mean, they were not, you didn't have to be that kind of an ingenious, kind of super smart person to win against right. that kind of system. Um, a system that was unresponsive to the population, lacked legitimacy in the eyes of many, was corrupt to its core, was unresponsive to the population. I mean, it was bound to and was almost entirely dependent on foreign support, financial and, and military. The sad thing is that that system was the only way to maintain a republic in Afghanistan because that was the government that was overseeing the Republican form of governance. And the failure of that government brought about the, the, the collapse of the republic. So I think um, that's the sad part because we had a civil society that was vibrant. There was an open space for women to participate. I mean, there were a lot of good things were going on, but all of those right. good things were buttressed by this failing system, the failing governance system. And when those kind of pillars of governance failed, everything else that was built upon them also collapsed and Taliban just able to take over. So Harun, then we can, I mean, you, you are an expert also on, on political science and, and you're a policy researcher. Can we view this? Of course, there's failures on so many uh, different levels and so many different aspects to a, a very complex situation in Afghanistan, frankly, uh, and very convoluted. But can we look at this as perhaps uh, a systemic failure as well? I think it generally is, I mean, in terms of the major actors, I mean, you can look at the international community, US was the main uh, international player. They, if you, and, and there's a 20 years occupation, like the 20 years war, and they made all the mistakes you could make um, in the 20 years. They alienated the population. They were um, fighting a war on Afghan, uh, on Afghan population because they had a hard time separating an insurgency that had uh, that was not that much different from local population in many fronts, in, in many aspects. The, they were backing a government that was corrupt and predatory. Um, the government they set up was corrupt and predatory, partly because they had, they set, set, it up, set it up. I mean, people did not get to. Um, when, when the US took over Afghanistan, they aligned themselves with the worst of the worst, the warlords. I mean, you have to realize that the Taliban, and there were fighting going on. Taliban in the 90s were fighting some warlords in Afghanistan because of mostly ethnicity. There was war going on because of mostly ethnicity. When the US stepped in, they basically stepped in on the side of the warlords who were fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan. And they, when they won, they basically gave the power to those warlords who were fighting the Taliban. And those warlords had prey, pride, uh, uh, preyed upon the population. They had brutalized the population for a very long time. So the Taliban, the US invasion empowered some of the worst of the worst in Afghanistan, just because of the fact that they aligned themselves with the Opposition of the Taliban. So some just because some people were fighting Taliban did not make did not mean they were good people. Uh, good people. Right. I'm not like, in terms of good and bad morally. Well, it wasn't black and white. Absolutely. So the if if when we say about the failure of the U.S., they made all the mistakes you could make, and it's not my my opinion. If you read Sigar, that is the uh, special um, in, uh, inspector for Afghanistan reconstruction, which is uh, set up by Congress to look at the Afghanistan war, and they basically said all of this that. We really did not, were supporting bad actors in Afghanistan. We, so right. we allowed the corruption to go on. We were just giving money to the people without accountability and oversight. 
We did not have a vision of what victory would look like. The U.S. did not have a vision of what victory looked like. Um, they went in just basically toppling the, using the military force to topple the uh, Taliban without having a right. good understanding of what they were undertaking in terms of reforming a country or building a state. And for very Failure long, not- on behalf of international uh, partners as well. Uh, you mentioned that. But also in terms of systemic failure, I'm referring to uh, the governance that we were discussing. W- would you boil that down to systemic failure that created a vacuum for uh, for the Taliban that was able to organize itself much better during this time? I think I mean, the, it boils down to me. And as I said, it comes to a matter of legitimacy. And I think it boils down to whether the government was accountable to the people or not. Because, I mean, people in power always tend to maximize their power, take advantage of their, their position. I mean, that's a na- national tendency. But in yes. some places, there are limits. I mean, there are accountable to the population, meaning if they do something wrong, and the ultimate test is whether people are can do approve of what they do or not, they will face consequences. In Afghanistan, the way the system was set up, there was really no consequences. A person could be corrupt, continue to steal from the population, did not deliver, I mean, did not make deliver services, fail on any fronts, and is still uh, remain in office. I'll just give you a factoid. I mean, just the, just the story. I think it kind of just illustrates how the government was operating. Yes, and go I'm, ahead. I'm changing the names just to obviously protect people's identities. So there's Understood. a person sitting in the cabinet, in a cabinet meeting. He's not a minister, but he was sitting in a cabinet meeting and he's a foreign person, he's not an Afghan. And he asked his uh, Afghan colleague who was a cabinet member, he said, okay, so how, how these people became ministers? How did they came become minister? And he pointed to person X and said, that person can bring 100 fighters to Kabul to challenge the government tomorrow. That's why he became the minister because he basically had the power to cause problems for the government. And he went Man to power. The, right. And you're talking about the earlier governments when there was just basically a coalition of different warlords and a people who were given power to just make sure they do not fight the government. They were given power yes. to not fight the government. And he basically said that person can bring in 200 people to Kabul to challenge the government that is be set up by the United States. That's why he was given a share of power. So basically to appease him, to make sure that um, the, and he saw that as that way. He saw it as a share of, like a basically a booty of war. I fought, we won, now there's a government, there's money coming in. I want a share of this because I was the reason we won. So it was not basically, I get a ministry so I can deliver service for people. I get a ministry because I fought, I, I was on the winning side. Now I, might, I want my share. Basically, that was the mentality. And Like a conqueror sort of mentality. Right. That's something we see with the Taliban as well. As I said, a lot of people in the Taliban movement yes. got the power just because they were the ones helped the government, the Taliban win the war. And they're seeing yes. it as a booty of war. And he went to Karzai at the time Karzai was the president. And he said, how did Karzai become, get to become president? And he said, and I can never forget it. He said, Karzai can call in the US army if he wants to. So the person who is the president is the person who has the US backing and literally means US army. Like literally meant like, if you challenge him, the US would step in and back you up. But everyone else has some sort of local militia basically that they can use okay. to challenge the government. So the, your power, your share of governments depended on how much militia you had to challenge the government. And the person overseeing it all was the person President Kaz at the time who could use the US army to basically win over other militias, like suppress other people who had guns and could challenge him. That was the setup. I mean, if you describe that- was that, the, the hierarchy, was, so to speak. That was the government, literally cabinet equals the government. That was the government. So if you describe that to anyone, I think they would not have a hard time understanding how that government would fail in terms of delivering services, doing anything good for the population. Understood. Haru, now uh, at the moment, uh, we are witnessing this humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Uh, Also, uh, there's a healthcare crisis and that too in the midst of a pandemic. Um, in addition to that, uh, last time when we were discussing, uh, when you and I spoke, uh, education was also uh, halted to a certain extent. Um, but you did share with me that it had gone online. How is Afghanistan coping on those fronts now? And do you think the Taliban will be able to combat these challenges? So, I mean, major issue Taliban have is just funding. I mean, uh, the. 75% of public expenditure in Afghanistan was coming from aid, foreign money. Foreign donors. Uh, yes, foreign donors, 75% of public expenditure. 
um, and more than 50% of the budget of the government was coming from outside. Uh, I mean, basically the economy was dependent on foreign money. Kabul, a city of five, six million people, really doesn't produce anything. It was just the seat of the government and the NGOs and such. I mean, everyone left village came to Kabul because of that money, because the money was coming from outside to Kabul and was, was distributed through different, different avenues. A lot of it was stolen, but some of it find its way to, to the economy. Now Taliban have to have an economy without that much money. It is, it is not imaginable that they will receive that kind of money ever again. I mean, this is not gonna happen. How they can do it, I really don't know. I think they will have to downsize the government, make the government smaller. They will have to find interested parties who could invest in Afghanistan, right? Um, the mining sector is one possibility. China has recognized again, those the Taliban. Are dependent on... China, China has recognized government... the Taliban. Do you think they could be a strategic partner in terms of uh, when it comes to the economy, perhaps? As we so see with Pakistan, I mean, so China and Pakistan are strongly allied in the region. I mean, there uh, there's been a strong yes. alliance between Chinese and Pakistan, China and Pakistan for different reasons. For decades, yes. to it, one road been built, and there's also political alliance. So I think the it is overblown. The Chinese potential is overblown. First of all, China offers uh, its investment as interest-bearing loans, like when they go and build infrastructures they give the funding as an interest as interest bearing loans. That's how they did it in, in Africa. Taliban yes. ideologically cannot accept interest. That is against their understanding of Islam. Also, China is primarily interested in extracting resources. I mean, look at the example of Baluchistan in, 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 in Pakistan. And they're there yeah. to extract gas, right? And they will build ports and they will build roads. And you have to realize ports and roads are meant to carry things outside the country. That is the whole reason they are doing it. Of course. They're, they're not gonna go in Afghanistan and invest in recovering Afghanistan agricultural basis. I mean, Afghanistan agriculture has no benefit to China. And, but that's the vital sector for Afghans. I mean, at least half of the population is still is involved in agriculture. Will China come in and help Afghanistan agriculture grow? I don't think, I mean, they, it doesn't make sense for them to do. They're business minded when it comes to investment in other countries. So I think, and also they even bring in their own workforce. I mean, even in China, in Pakistan, they don't use a lot of workers from Pakistan even. There are even medium level and lower level yes. workers come from China. So if you think yes. about job creating jobs, if you think about the agriculture, which has to be the core of recovery in Afghanistan, China is not that interested and it's never been. I think it would be, would like to have good relationship with the Taliban to make sure that the Taliban would Rain in anti-China anti-China terrorist groups inside Afghanistan, but, but China it's not has the, promised aid though. Thirty-five million. Thirty that's, thirty-one million um, dollars. I believe. Sorry, thirty-one yes. million in yes. medicine, and that's in kind. That's not money. That's in kind. That's vaccines, For food, and, and food. vaccines. Right. Yes. It means that in terms of actual economic values, it's often like it more likely much less than that because when countries offer in kind, right. I mean they they price it at, at whatever. But so do you think the international community should be stepping up and supporting Afghanistan or uh, like we've seen all these calls for sanctioning the Taliban, are those counterproductive uh, for the international community to do at this point and putting the Afghans at a disadvantage? Is that, is that what you're saying? I think we have to separate two issues. One is issue of humanitarian aid. That's basically food and medicine make people don't die. We don't fa they don't face famine because famine is real. Afghanistan has been going through drought. A lot of people depend on the import of, of food in the country. Medicine, obviously, as you said, there's a drought going on. There's a polio outbreak in the country. It's one of the places in the world that it still has polio. Um, so th that's a one issue. And I think that should be made unconditional. Like every country in the world should try unconditionally, regardless of what Taliban do. Even if Taliban just start tomorrow, like killing women for no reasons. I'm just making an ex egregious example. Right, of course, you don't support that, but still, if that happens. If that happens, it still aid should continue because not to do it would basically condemn millions of Afghans to actual, hung, I mean, famine and possibly dying from many diseases that are, can be prevented. So I'm saying that aid is a different issue and it has to continue. And I'm hoping that they can actually continue aid because it's a matter of, okay, if they want to even, there is a legal regime of sanctions that may stop them. 
U.S. signaled that they would be willing to compromise on this because I think U.S. Treasury told the NGOs that they can go ahead and operate in Afghanistan uh, without fearing that prosecution from the U.S. U.N. is stepping up. They are making it a condition that the Taliban government should not intervene, so they respect the autonomy of the aid delivery agency. They would not do it based on the Taliban policy, but they would do it regardless of Taliban policy. And I think that's a correct approach. There is a conference coming up, 14th of September. I think that's important for countries to commit to aid. But aid is a bandit. That's people not dying. In terms of economy, people getting a job, people actually being able to make a living, that's investment. That you need infrastructure, you need roads, you need belt, you need agriculture to, to recover. And that those things require huge investments. That's a different question. No country will look at that in a humanitarian lens. Um, US did that because they had obviously nation building hopes or they had major country insurgency goals. They did it or just because of whatever reasons they did it. China is not gonna do that, at least at, as things stand, like $20 million in terms of food and medicine doesn't, it's not an indicator that China is gonna step up the way it was expected. Um, right. So a Taliban problem, even if the world chooses to um, deliver aid to Afghanistan, which is absolutely, I think they should, and it should be made unconditional on anything. It should uh, continue. Taliban problem still remains to get investments to, rec to make the economy to save the economy. That's gonna have a much more complicated kind of discussion. US is unlikely to remove sanctions. Um, and if the US removes sanctions, not no major company, even Chinese state-owned companies would be willing to invest in Afghanistan. You can look at just Iran. They're not investing in Iran. Iran is a huge price compared to Afghanistan. I mean, they have oil, it's a different market. Yes. I mean, it's a huge market. Chinese state-owned companies are not doing that much work in Iran because of the fact that the Iran is just sanctioned by the United States. So Harun, the argument that you're making right now, uh, which we were just discussing the sanctions, the sanctions are counterproductive when it comes to the future of Afghans or the economy of Afghanistan. Naturally, the country cannot be reliant on aid forever and has to find means of self-sustainability. Absolutely. And I think for domestic political reasons, sanctions are not gonna be removed. It's not a matter of what I wish, what wish happened. I think removing sanctions may actually help Afghanistan, but I don't think if you just adopt the domestic politics of the United States, if you look at the domestic politics right. of the United States. In terms of practicality, practicality, removing them would be more I think a positive step. Save a Taliban complete reform. I mean, Taliban completely reforming themselves or making very hard choices that they have shown no indication they're willing to do, like including women in the government. One major step, like give a ministerial position to a woman or work very hard to keep al-Qaeda in, in, in charge, work hard to keep other terrorist groups that the many countries consider as a threat to them in, in charge. I think unless Taliban transformed to something that they are not yet, um, it is very unlikely for domestic political reasons for those sanctions to be removed. Arun, without... which brings me to my next point, sorry to interject. Uh, if these sanctions, let's say, hypothetically, if they are removed, don't you think that could also prove to be counterproductive and perhaps embolden the Taliban and make them as repressive, if not more repressive than they were in the 1990s? I think, it's a double-edged sword, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. I think the alternative is that you assume, we, the assumption is that Taliban would care about the economic downturn that comes from continuation of sanctions. Like basically the argument is that sanctions do work to achieve an objective of weakening a system, weakening a government, gri grip on the country. I have the case of Iran to show you, I mean, Iran has been sanctioned for so long. Yes. Did it make the Iran moderate its stance? No, actually there are arguments. Iraq also, before the war, Iraq was sanctioned for a long time. Did make Saddam like less dictatorial? Make Saddam, I mean, did it make Iraq more democratic? Iran, has it made Iran more democratic? The answer is, I mean, Iraq and Iran are both resource-rich countries, so they had a way to manage things. And Taliban right. may actually, if they are sanctioned, if they are sanctioned to the extreme, I think they may actually have to rely on opium because, I mean, would have to. It would be not, no money left, or they may actually rely on the illegal kind of funds of that may Al Qaeda or other extreme groups may give them. So I think sanctions don't work in terms of moderating anyone. Um, Taliban are an ideological group. I don't think they're going to be that sensitive to the economy to moderate their basic core ideological positions. So the choice is whether to punish the population 
or let the economy grow and hope that there will be some internal form of resistance based in the country organically that would challenge the Taliban to the point that they would have to moderate their stance. I think if you give people education, like let people go to school and the education is not the indoctrination, meaning like Taliban don't allow modern education to happen. I think over time, the situation is gonna improve. I think just educated people, I mean, just take women. If you have women who have university degrees, they're gonna pressure to find a way to actually use that degree in some sort, sort of way. If the Taliban are willing to allow women to go to university, I think down the road, they have to allow women to participate in society. People are not gonna take a college degree and just sit home. I mean, that's not the natural way people, I mean, if people have become educated, they, they women, I, I mean, educated, they right. have an understanding. You're arguing they're more likely to rise up. Harun, just a, a final question uh, and just briefly, uh, Saturday will mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11, uh, of the September 11th attacks, uh, attacks that changed the world, frankly speaking, uh, not just the United States, not just Afghanistan, uh, but the world. And many people all over the world uh, share a lived experience of the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, and this year has been more significant because all of the U.S. forces uh, withdrew and the war has virtually ended for Americans. Um, and you said earlier that the war has also ended in Afghanistan, or at least that extreme level of violence has ended in Afghanistan. But as a final question, Harun, what do you think the United States achieved uh, in a war that lasted 20 years, the longest war the United States has fought? What, do, what in your view, were the key achievements of the United States in Afghanistan? I mean, there are certain things that are obvious you can look at. Um, the the mortality rate of uh, women in Afghanistan, I mean, the child mortality rate, like number of women who die in giving birth, dropped dramatically. Uh, the, and the life expectancy of Afghans grew dramatically, like they've gained multiple years because of better health sector, better uh, uh, economy that means better food, I mean, many things. You can look at literacy rates. Literacy rates for Afghans increased dramatically. Um, and before the US invasion of Afghanistan, no girl was formally in school. Now. Six, I think 40% of the girls in school, not university, are, are girls. So, I mean, you can look at, point at those achievements and say, those were achieved. I mean, they were achieved at a cost. The U.S. 20 years war cost a lot of, lo a lot of lives as well. Nearly How one million people died, uh, of which many were claimed to be countless. militants. But, of course, it's more gray than that. Uh, many Absolutely. would have been countless civilians. Lives. Countless lives lost. I mean, I don't think anyone and knows many how many lives as well. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there are point gains, like narrow gains you can look at, but you have to weigh it against the, the loss of life, literally loss of life, Just how many lives were destroyed. Um, I think not all of it was in the US. I mean, you have to realize that the Taliban were a brutal insurgency as well. I think sometimes Taliban pointed the American and the government and say, that's what you did over the past 20 years. Taliban were not sitting idle the past 20 years either. They were killing people. They were cutting people who were going to vote. I mean, democracy failed in Afghanistan, Okay, but you play the Taliban played a major role in making sure the democracy would fail. So I'm just saying when we talk about the US failure or Afghan government doesn't absolve Taliban of any responsibility. They were equally responsible for all the things, even corruption. They made sure that the Afghanistan was hard to govern and they made sure that the government could not hold warlords accountable because the government needed warlords to keep the Taliban at bay. So that's a different point. US achieved certain things in Afghanistan at a very, very high cost. And I think the more fundamental achievement in terms of whether Afghanistan has become a better place or not is gonna depend on how the coming year is gonna unfold. Whether there will be a meaningful, nonviolent domestic resistance to the Taliban that advocates for women rights and advocates for more inclusive government. If those, I mean, Afghanistan gets on the right track, basically. If Afghanistan gets on the right track, despite now that there is a Taliban push to the extreme, where there will be a push against the Taliban that would put Afghanistan on the right track historically, from a historical perspective, I think I would judge the past 20 years differently. If no, we go back to like 90s, meaning there is, there is really no way to preserve some of the more fundamental changes that happen in Afghan society. And everyone leaves, like everyone who can leaves and everyone who remains is subject to a repressive dictatorship. Basically there's really nothing preserved of what was gained in the past 20 years. I think I would judge it differently. So I think, the chapter on the past 20 years, what it's achieved is not closed yet because it's gonna come down in terms of 
how sustainable those bottom-up changes, people getting an education, like Afghan women on the street are the ones who received an education during the US there. I mean, what would that mean for the future of Afghanistan? We don't know yet. Um, but I think one thing is absolutely clear that it was a bloody war. It was a war that cost too many countless lives, lives unnecessarily, meaning that different, if different choices had been made over the past 20 years, we could have saved more lives. We could have actually put Afghanistan on the right track much faster if the corruption was curtailed, uh, was more seriously fought. If the people, will of people of Afghanistan, if people want votes and people's voice were listened to more, it would have been a different place. Um, so there's countless mistakes and it costs countless lives, mostly Afghan lives. I mean, US lost soldiers in Afghanistan and I think, I'm, I think we should acknowledge that. Of so course, we must acknowledge that. Yeah. But the and numbers the of Afghans were astronomical. Uncomparable. In I mean, uncomparable. And, 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 and the cost of war project really highlights these statistics. Absolutely. I mean, the US, it was mostly treasure. And I mean, for some US, it was the ultimate price. I mean, well, for some Americans, it was the sons, their husbands, I mean, or their daughters. Obviously, that is the ultimate price for that American family. But if you're looking at the American as the, like, the, the country, then um, you have a different approach. I mean, you can look at it from a political lens, but you can also look at it from a humanitarian lens. And I think I acknowledge that there are families in the United States that paid the ultimate price uh, because I think many of them believed that they were making a difference, a good difference. I think I really am grateful personally to that family who did that. But you can obviously be critical and I am extremely critical of the US policymakers who enable the corrupt system in Afghanistan, impose the corrupt system on Afghanistan because as I said, the government was not accountable to Afghans. There was really no way for people to hold government accountable. And every time they tried, they used, usually the US were afraid of the instability that that would bring and pretty much supported the government, enabled what the government was doing. Afghans did not give money or weapon to the warlords of Afghanistan to brutalize the population and make the Taliban look good in comparison. The US did that, and I think it was the US policymakers. It is a mixed picture, but it's a bloody picture. Harun, uh just a final word. Uh, what hope do you have for Afghanistan um, looking at the current situation and being someone who has lived in a post-Taliban Afghanistan and is now uh, might have to be, might have to return to uh, a Taliban run Afghanistan. What hope do you have for, for your country? I honestly hope that the war doesn't restart in any form. I think I hope that there would be no armed resistance against the Taliban necessary, meaning that they would, Taliban would do what it takes to actually uh, make peace in Afghanistan. Um, I hope that happens because I think nothing good comes out of war. Afghanistan has been in war for 40, 40 years. I hope there, there is a possibility for gradual bottom-up change uh, to nonviolent struggle in Afghanistan, because I think that is the way that Afghanistan can get on the right track and from a historical perspective, it means that this generation of Afghanistan is going to have to pay a very high price, I'm meaning they're going to have to tolerate the repressive regime of Taliban. I mean, Taliban is not going to change overnight, but if they are persistent, and I think if they actually do the hard work of, and that's included me, like if we do the hard work of talking to people, basically trying to educate the Afghan youth, trying to change basically people's minds about who they should support and how what they should be doing, and if you get critical mass of enough people who actually believe in, in that kind of change and are willing to do the work, often putting their lives at risk and doing all the things people did um, over a long period of time, I'm hoping that we can uh, have a more uh, democratic Afghanistan. And I believe in values of democracy and, and liberal democracy, which are basically a small government and letting people make their choices. Muslims who believe in any version of Islam should be able to practice their Islam, but no one should be able to use violence and guns to impose their understanding of Islam on everyone. So I want to have Afghanistan where a Talib can be, actually practice their faith the way they, they understand it. Um, families, communities, free associations should be able to manifest any types of beliefs that Afghanistan, Afghans hold. But I would hope that it is a political system that does not use violence to control every aspect of human life. I don't want a totalitarian, authoritarian, repressive government. Harun, thank you so much. Uh, that was Harun Rahimi uh, joining us from Rome. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm gonna stop.